This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions. Today's big question, how do we build a better world after COVID? We're asking today's big question to Dr. Christopher Watkin. Chris works as a senior lecturer in French studies at Monash University in Melbourne. His research seeks to understand how people make sense of the world and how they interact with ideas and positions different from their own. He's an author, blogger, philosopher, and thought leader, and he joins me now. Chris, welcome to Bigger Questions. Thank you, Robert. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you, Chris. Now, you teach French and read a lot of French literature. So does that mean that you're an expert in love? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to cheat. And, and I'm going to say I'm a philosopher. And so that means I am an expert in love with wisdom. Uh, from the Greek philo Sophia, uh, love of wisdom. So yeah, I'm an expert, comma, in love. Uh, but no, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a bit of a cop out. I mean, isn't all French literature supposed to be all about love? Isn't France, French the language of love? <laughs> um, look, I'm I'm going to make a bigger claim than that. I'm going to I'm going to trump you and say right. the whole the whole of thought is actually about love. Everything that we think is actually about love. Um, so the uh, Christian philosopher Esther Meek uh, has written a book, and she says that uh, rather than sort of knowing in order to love, we actually as human beings we love in order to know. And there's a beautiful quotation, one of the many beautiful quotations from Augustine's City of God, where he says something similar. He says, uh, as the body is borne along by gravity, and the body obeys the law of gravity, uh, so the spirit uh, is carried along by love wherever it goes. Now, I think that's a pretty good summary of us as human beings. Uh, so everything we do is out of love. Well, Chris, we're going to ask a big question today. Perhaps it's going to be for love for some, as we reflect on philosophy and some of life's biggest questions. But we're talking today about uh, the coronavirus pandemic and how it's shaped and changed our world because it's led to a lot of disruption and change right across the world. And today's big question does ask about how to build a better world after COVID. Now, one particular idea at Envisaging a Better World was proposed last year by the World Economic Forum called the Great Reset. So now, Chris, you've done a lot of thinking and research into this. So can you just tell us a bit about what is the Great Reset? Yeah, thanks, Rob. It, it's one of the really interesting sort of part of an interesting trend that we're seeing at the moment to brand the idea of a new social contract. So there's lots of people calling for a new social contract today. You've got the UN Secretary General, Extinction Rebellion, you know, the people lining up to do that. And, and there are three or four different ways of branding that. So you've got the um, Green New Deal, uh, is one way of, of sticking a label on a new social contract. There's the Build Back Better agenda. And this Great Reset is one of those brandings. It's quite a particular branding. Uh, it comes mm -hmm. out of the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the World Economic Forum, you know, that group of uh, everyone from the, the CEO of MasterCard, Prince Charles, Greta Thunberg, prime ministers, presidents uh, that meet at Davos each January yeah. when, <laughs> when there's no pandemic on. Um, and it's, it's headed up by a, a German engineer and economist called Klaus Schwab. So that's the, the think tank, if you like, that this idea of the Great Reset uh, is coming out of. And it's sort of an idea not to miss the moment, I guess. So when you mm -hmm. listen to these people talk about the Great Reset, uh, they often say the financial crisis of 2008 was a huge missed opportunity. Uh, there was a golden moment to change the system, and we didn't. And therefore, we're mm. going to risk everything happening again and, and a new financial crash. And they say COVID-19 is another one of these unfrozen moments, uh, the moment where radical change is more possible in society than it mm. usually is, uh, and they're determined not to miss it. They want to change society mm. as they see it for the better at the moment. Yes. Well, well, Klaus Schwab actually has said, he says the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world. So, so that, that's, he's looking at obviously at the world after to COVID and he sees that there's opportunity to change. That, that's how you, you're seeing it here? Yeah, pretty much so. I, I think the word reset, though, is, is a little bit of a red herring. So the idea is not mm -hmm. to go back to some, so, you know, when you reset your computer, that's not what they're suggesting. It's not a going back. It's actually a propelling us, accelerating us forward, really. Um, and mm. trends that are happening at the moment, they want to happen more quickly. Uh, and there's basically 
three things, as far as I can see, yeah. that the great reset guys want to do. Uh, they want to make society greener. Uh, they want to make society more digital. Uh, and they want to make society fairer. Um, and now all right. those are things that are already happening. You don't want to go back in time. It's not a reset. It's it's an acceleration. So almost a reimagination, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. How society ought to look and how can we get there? Yeah, yeah. So how how do they? I mean, that sounds all pretty pretty good, I suppose, in many ways, a digital green, uh, fairer world. But how do they propose to get there? That's a really interesting question. Again, I think a lot of their rhetoric is quite top down. So mm -hmm. it's about regulation. It's about new laws. It's about sort of big multinational corporations setting agendas, um, and. So not to jump the gun and, and to get into a critique of this, but I think that's that's part of the issue, um, that social change isn't just managed from the top down. Um, it's part of it, mm. of course, but that there's more to changing a culture and changing a society than just bringing new laws and new regulations in. Yeah, so if you've just brought in new laws, so to speak, it's not really changing much Fundamentally, is it though? Is it is it is it can it kind of have that potential to change things fundamentally by just changing the law? Well, I think you can fall off this donkey on on both sides. You, you can go to two extremes. You can either say social change only happens bottom up. It's about communities. It's about agitation. It's about activism, um, and the law is always a, a you know what they call a lagging indicator. It's always playing catch up. Or you can sort of. Um, jump to the other extreme and say it's it's laws and it's governments that change cultures. Now, I think there's something in both of those, but I think both of them are inadequate. If you look at something like uh, the civil rights movement uh, of the mid 20th century mm. in the US, uh, that social change happened because of a lot of reasons. There was a, a local and a micro local level. There was cultural change. There was lobbying government. There was big sort of set piece speeches. I have a dream and so forth. And, and so I think we can't say either social change has nothing to do with changing laws and regulations, but we can't say that social change is just about those things either. Hmm. But Chris, you're a philosopher, an expert in love, perhaps, uh, an expert in French studies. It seems a long way from the World Economic Forum and social transformation and so on. So what got you interested in the Great Reset and, and the future of the world, so to speak? The thing that I'm working on at the moment, the thing that I've I've got some funding to to have a look at for four years uh, of my life, uh, is the idea of the social contract, uh, mm. and of course that's a big idea for society broadly, but it's also really big in in French philosophy as well. One of the big theorists of the social contract is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and uh, since him there have been other big French thinkers of the social contract, uh, and so coming at that from a French point of view. Uh, trying to see what do Rousseau and others, Hobbes, Locke, Rawls in the 20th century, uh, think that the social contract is? Um, where is it under stress in society today? Uh, and what strengthens it uh, is sort of the, the big tent of which, mm. um, you know, the Great Reset is one of the tables uh, within that tent. Yeah. Mm. Now, you've mentioned this social contract. I mean, that's what you're saying about the, the World Economic Forum's proposal is a, a new social contract. But what exactly is a social contract? So I don't think I've signed anything to enter into society. So what, 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 what exactly is one? Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's, there's a general sort of everyday conversation version of what the social contract is. And it's basically what we're entitled to in, expect of each other in society. So you know, if a policeman shoots a black man because he is black, that is a breach of the social contract. Mm. Um, if, if I walk into a supermarket during lockdown without a mask on, that is a breach of the social contract. It's one of those things that it's a, really hard to sort of put your finger on exactly what it is, but mm. you know when it's been broken. It's more than just laws, isn't it? It's actually uh, the way that we, it's sort of the glue that sort of sit, knits society together. So I've mixed the metaphors there, so to speak, but <laughs> but it's something that it's ex, societal expectations, perhaps. Is that is that what the way of, uh, but connected to the the way that the society thinks, I suppose, yeah, and the completely. laws that, that, are, that are there. Absolutely. So it's what underpins laws and makes laws possible, really. It's, it's things like uh, trust and the sense of reciprocity. I give a bit and get a bit in society. You give a bit and get a bit. Um, and it, it's sort of looking at it philosophically, it, it's really the idea of the common good. It's the idea that we could both go off and live in the forest separately. 
and that would be great in a sense that we could do just whatever we wanted, take whatever we want, mm. exploit whatever we want, do whatever we want. We'd, we'd have that natural freedom. But actually, both you and I and pretty much everyone else in society thinks that I'll be better off if I give up some of that natural freedom you know, don't just go around doing whatever I want to whoever I want in order to live in society and have the benefits of, of what philosophers might call civic freedom or political freedom. And, and, and therefore, that there's a common good, that my good and your good are bound up together. They're not completely separate. And that's that's what brings us together in the social contracts. And you're dead right. It's not something that you sign, you know, when you come out of the womb before the umbilical cord is cut. Sign this, are we sending you back? You know? <laughs> right. um, but it's, it's implicit. It's a tacit agreement that the fact that you choose to stay in society is a tacit agreement that you're buying into this idea of the common good. Mm. So the fact that they're proposing a new social contract, does that mean that there are some contracts that are better than others in order to create a flourishing society? Um, look, I, th I think there's certainly a sense that people have a keen understanding of when the social contract is not working uh, and therefore you know when it needs fixing. And so I think when you talk about... Um, is there a better social contract than another? I think what you're probably, what one's probably getting at is the sense of, do we have this good idea of the common good? You know, do I mm. see my best interests and my good life as being tied up with your good life in society? And I think there's a fair case to say that that, that idea is under quite a bit of strain at the moment. The idea that that there are different, such different views of the good life and a flourishing in society that, that, that there, there's a loss of this sense of there's a common good that ties us all together mm. and that we all win or we all lose together. So does that help explain why our world seems so polarised at the moment? I think it's part of it. Um, I think it's another one of these hugely complex questions that social media plays a role, the filter bubble. Um, the, the the loss of a sense of, of civility, the, the the ramping up of the heat of political and, and public rhetoric, uh, and there are, there are many different reasons for that. Mm. So back to the the Great Reset from the World Economic Forum, they're proposing a new social contract to build a, a greener, more digital, more fairer world. Do you think it can work? Um, yeah. You're going to hate me, Rob, because I, I'm not going to say just yes or no. <laughs> um, here, here's one way of looking at it. Society is going to change. Ten years from now, we're not going to be living in the same society we are now. So change is inevitable. Uh, it's not a question of do we want change or not. It's a question of how is it going to change and who is going to drive that change. Uh, and from that point of view, I think that the, the Great Reset is really valuable and that it's part of a conversation. Uh, it's one group, if you like, one coalition within society with, with its own interests and its own blind spots and its own views of how things work, contributing to this bigger debate. I think the danger comes if that's the only group contributing to the debate, because then you get a very blinkered and unnecessarily partial. This is not a critique of, of necessarily of the, of the people who are advocating for the Great Reset. It's just a recognition of what it means to be human. None of us have, have the whole picture. And so if that's the only voice you're hearing when you think about how to rewrite mm. the social contracts, then it's a massive problem. But yeah, come on, let's let's have the um, Great Reset people in the conversation. and But let's make sure that there are other groups as well representing a range of voices and perspectives within society. Mm. So what other groups do you think should be a part of this formulation of the future of how the world looks after COVID? Look, I, I think the ideal, if it's a common good, is to have everybody's interests represented. I mean, that's one thing that, for better or worse, and you know, sometimes it doesn't do it that well, democracy tries to do. Everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets a say. Mm. So, Chris, you are a Christian person and you believe that the Bible has something to offer. So what do you think the Bible could offer on a vision for the future and how to create a better world post-COVID? Yeah, I think that one of the really healthy ways that, that that a Christian view of the world can contribute to this debate is in giving us a particular, uh, what you might call, disposition to society. And, and let me just try and cash out what I mean by that, because that's that's a big abstract noun that doesn't really help anyone. Um, the, the, the Christian view of the world is, is basically boiled down into, into three words, isn't it? It's creation, fall, and redemption. God created the world, um, things went wrong, uh, and he will put it right. 
in the end. And that gives you a rhythm. It gives you a pattern for the whole of reality. And, and particularly, I think it gives you a pattern for the for the sense of of how you should expect society to be renewed and what what we can expect of a renewal of society. So, um, just very quickly, creation, um, the the idea that things things were made to be good, things weren't made to fail and to go wrong in the beginning. Human beings were made to be good. Um, so there's no sense in the Christian view in which we're simply you know, I don't know trash or to be managed or a liability. Human beings are incredibly precious and important. Um, but that's not the only truth that the Bible tells us about us or about society. There's also the idea that we've, we've turned away from God. Uh, we've chosen uh, to follow uh, our own lights uh, and to, to seek our own good, if you like. And the problem is, if mm -hmm. you've got a, a world of you know six, seven, eight billion people all seeking their own good, that's a lot of clashing goods. <laughs> and that's not going to make <laughs> for um, a, a harmonious uh, or strong uh, social contract. Um, but then, you know, there's the redemption. That That's not the final chapter. Um, and God has a plan and he's going to put things right. And so mm. I think what that tells us in terms of renewal of society is to be more sober than the pessimists and at the same time, more optimistic than the utopians. You know, so the Bible leaves you in no doubt about the depths that human beings can sink to. Um, and, and mm. you know, there, there are some social theories that think people are basically really, really good. And all you need to do is, is get rid of the um, social structures that are keeping them down and then everything's going to be wonderful. I don't think that's a biblical mm. view. But then again, there are other social theories that think people are basically corrupt and selfish and you need strong government and tough punishments to keep them from messing everything up because that's what they're going to do if left to themselves. And I don't think that's the biblical view either. Um, mm. and, and I think there's also a sense in which it's not just half of one and half of the other in the Bible. Um, there's what the philosopher Paul Ricoeur called an asymmetry between good and evil. Good comes before evil. Uh, it's, it's more radical. It's, it's deeper, more fundamental than evil. Um, evil has a, a sell-by date in our universe. Mm. Uh, it will, th there will be an end to that. And so I think that the mm. Christian position, while recognizing the, the, the depths that human beings can sink to always finishes on a note of hope. Uh, there's an mm. ineradicable, fundamental, structural, skeletal hope. And, and I think that gives you a disposition you know, towards thinking what's possible in society, what are humans going to do if left to themselves, can we renew society? And, and it's a complex one, isn't it? It's not just whatever mm. we do, we stuff it up. And it's not just, mm. just let us get at it and we're going to make a fantastic society. I think it gives you a complexity and a nuance that sometimes it's just a little bit hard to get with views of the world that don't have that asymmetry of good and evil in them. Mm. Well, the Bible does offer some ideas or some glimpses perhaps of a disposition uh, in, in, in other ways as well about how a flourishing future can be developed. And some of these ideas perhaps are found when Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was in Mark 12, 29 to 31. He answered by saying, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So Chris, what do you think then of the, the concept of loving your neighbor as yourself in the idea of the social contract and, and trying to create a flourishing world? How could that work? Mm, yeah, thank you, Rob. It, I mean, it's a very rich idea in the, in the Christian tradition and, and central to Jesus's teaching, isn't it? It's a great verse to think about in relation to, to this idea of how to build a better society. Look, I, I think the first thing to unpack perhaps is uh, what what Jesus means by neighbor, because there are two things it could mean, and they would lead to very different societies. Um, right. If if by neighbor we mean people who are like us, you know, which tends to be the way that, that the word neighbor is used, people who live near me tend to be people who are basically like me, people in the same socioeconomic band and so forth, people who can afford houses near my house. Um, if that's what you mean by neighbor, then I think it's a pretty disastrous foundation for a social contract. Uh, because it's it's a recipe for a fractured society with different groups fighting against each other. If my neighbor is just to people who are like me, I don't think you've got a very strong society. But of course, that's not Jesus's idea of what a neighbor is. Um, and he he cashes it out, doesn't he, in that um, classic parable, that very uncomfortable parable of the Good Samaritan. 
uh, where the, the mm. expert in the law asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Uh, and Jesus tells him this story, which Jesus gives the answer, your neighbor is the person in society who you most despise, who is least mm. like you. Now, whoever you think is deluded and corrupt, that's your neighbor. And, and that'll be different for all of us, won't it? You know, for, for some of us, that will be Trump supporters. For others of us, that will be Antifa members. For some of us, that'll be traditionalists. For some of us, that'll be progressives. You know, Jesus says to all of us, very uncomfortably, that's your enemy. Love her. Love him. Mm. That's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. Yeah. I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, love your enemies as well. I think that was the, they become your neighbors. That's part of the, the, the subversion that perhaps that the Christian message offers. Well, well, best cue drop. You, you got me out of a hole there. That's exactly right. Yes. <laughs> love, love your enemies. Love your enemies. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Um, and, and, and okay, so I think love your enemies, love your neighbor in that sense, is the basis for a strong social contract. But it, we, we're still flying at 10,000 feet. We're still quite abstract. So let's try and drag that down to earth and say, okay, fine. It's a noble sentiment. What does it actually look like? Um, and mm. and let, me, let me offer four little vignettes as to what that looks like on the ground. Um, I, I think it means according people who disagree with us, the courtesy of thinking that they're in good faith until proven otherwise, that they really believe what they say and, until and unless mm. it becomes clear that they don't and, and they're just playing us. Uh, I think secondly, it means to, to be able to articulate the position of people you disagree with in a language that they would own as their own. So if I've got someone who disagrees with me and I try and explain their position and they say, yeah, that is exactly it. That's how I would explain it. That's what I believe. I think that's part of it. Um, I think thirdly, to, to understand not only why people who disagree with us think their position is true, but also why they think it's good and beautiful. I think that's important. You know, why that their position sparkles for them, why it's so attractive to them. Mm. And I think until we can do that, we haven't really understood the people that we engage, that we disagree with them, and, and we're not, perhaps not in a position to engage with them fully. And, and I think, fourthly, it means to try to win over those that disagree with you and not destroy them. Uh, I think that's mm. that's a way of, of loving your enemy as well. And, and all that really just boils down to treating other people like you'd want them to treat you, really. Mm. So how is what the Bible offers then distinct from other forms of social contracts? I think one way that you can come at that question is through this idea of, of love that we've been discussing. It, it's not common for the word love to appear in discussions of the social contract. Philosopher John Rawls is um, credited with single-handedly reviving social contract theory in the 20th century. And, and he's got some, some core ideas to what he thinks the social contract relies on. He's got fairness, uh, treating everybody in a way that's uh, and that's the, the world economic the Great Reset has the same same idea as well of fairness as, yeah. as a key element. F fairness and justice are, are often really key. Um, and and Rawls also has this idea of the gap between the richest and the poorest, or the most advantaged and the disadvantaged, should be as small as possible. So that's the, the language that you usually get. Um, but that's not love. It's quite a long way short of love. And, and if you trace the sort of language that's used around the way we relate to each other in society, uh, you know, in the 1990s, there was, there was a big emphasis on tolerance. Um, but I guess now the, the dominant discourse is equality. Um, but, but again, tolerance and equality, neither of those are, are love. And so I think that the, the bar the Bible is setting and the way that the Bible wants Christians to relate to other people is, is qualitatively different to what's usually there in social contract language. Uh, it, it, it's not just tolerance. It's not just equality. It's not just fairness. It's not just reducing the gap between the most and least privileged. Um, love is a richer, thicker, more challenging concept, I think, uh, than, than those mm. ideas. So could this offer something then to the social contract theorists then? is that love is, is a very sort of thick relational concept that reminds us that we're not just economic beings. So I think the danger of a lot of social contract theory is, is it reduces the complexity of human beings to, um, you know, to, to what philosophers have sometimes called a, a homo economicus, an economic man. But, but that doesn't capture the complexity of what we are. And I think love is perhaps a, a less reductive language 
to talk about everything that we are as human beings. Um, and, and it gets back into this Augustinian idea that I, I, I really love, no pun intended, um, that it, it's our loves that drive us. Um, there, there, there was a book, uh, James K. Smith published a book uh, a little while ago called You Are What You Love. Uh, and I think there's a real truth in that. Um, and mm. I, I think getting a, be, a bigger, more complex, more adequate anthropology, a bigger idea of the human being into social contract theory uh, is, is a really healthy move. And love does that, and you don't you don't have to be a Christian to 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 see that necessarily as as an important and a, a healthy thing to do. Mm. Mm. So, how about then you, Chris? What difference has the Christian faith made for you as you've considered this big question of you know social contracts, great resets, and, and making the world a better place? But I think that what it's shown me it, it is an approach to the social contract that takes account of the whole of the person. The Bible has a view of us as, as whole human beings. There's no fundamental division between public life and private life. There's no fundamental division between economic life and, and, and love life in a, in a broad sense of love, you know, what I love, what I, what I go after in society. And, and I think a lot of social contract theory, partly out of necessity, because human beings are so incredibly concept that they're hard to model, um, but, but partly in a way that really doesn't do justice to us as human beings, tends to simplify us and look at us through one particular lens. You know, we're economic utility maximizers or, or whatever we are. And, and there's been a lot of critique of social contract theory, actually, uh, from uh, the, the, the point of view that, that it actually assumes that we're all Western, modern, middle-class uh, males uh, as well. So basically it's, it's got these reductive models of the human being. And I, I think one thing that, that Christianity has, has helped me to see um, is that you can't reduce us like that. You can't take one bit of us and blow it up and pretend it's the whole thing. So Chris, how do we build a better world after COVID? Uh, well, Robert, in a sentence, we do it together and we do it as whole people. Let me leave you with some of the Bible's answer to the big question, how do we build a better world after COVID from Mark 12, 31. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. I look forward to you joining us next time for Bigger Questions. Many thanks to our guest today, Dr. Christopher Watkin. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> 